Welcome to Universe Sandbox 2 version alpha 18. Uh, this is the version that's improved the uh, functionality of the game dramatically and the simulation that used to slow down my computer by uh, a factor of 100, basically I bar barely was able to play this simulation, is now actually not so bad. This is a simulation called um, Sphere of Thousand Planets and as you can see I'm actually able to finally play it. Now in this particular uh, video we're actually not going to talk about version alpha 18. We're going to be talking about a question that someone asked me a long time ago and I never really got to answer it. How do scientists and astrophysicists and astronomers find and discover exoplanets and how do we know that some of them are actually similar to Earth because we can't actually see them. We cannot really, we don't have enough telescopes or telescopic um, power to actually be able to distinguish them and uh, we don't really know uh, if those planets actually look like Earth. So today we're going to investigate how do scientists actually know if a planet is like Earth? How do we, why do we claim that certain planets um, are uh, known as Earth 2.0. This is actually a claim that one of the NASA scientists made very recently. Uh, specifically, less than a year ago, we found a planet that we think is very Earth-like. And uh, to do this, we're actually going to take a, one of the new simulations as well that is under exoplanets right here. It's called Wolf 1061. This is probably the most recent discovery in December of 2015, where we now discovered a very, very close planet to us um, that's also very Earth-like. Anyway, welcome to What The Math and let's talk a little bit about exoplanets. <laughs> And so this is the simulation that is called Wolf 1061, where we've discovered a new planet, exoplanet, that is most likely very Earth-like. And But the coolest part about it is that it's actually only about 14 light years away from our, our sun. So it's not very far. It's actually only about three times as far away as uh, the closest star to us, which is Alpha Centauri. So if we ever visit this particular star, we might actually discover a planet that might actually look like Earth. And the planet that we're talking about, this is already actually pre-made for us, is this one right here called Wolf 1061C. Uh, now, we don't really know if this is what it looks like exactly, but what we do know is that it's in the region of space called the Goldilocks zone, which is what you see uh, uh, portrayed as green right here. And this is essentially the zone in space around the star where the heat from the star is not too high and not too low. So the green part is where we receive just enough heat for any kind of a planet. And let me just demonstrate this by placing a planet random uh, rocky planet right here in the middle and this planet will now receive just enough um, radiative heat from uh, this star uh, that will make it essentially habitable as long as we give it enough atmospheric pressure let's just go into atmosphere and give it one atmospheric pressure and this will now hopefully get warm enough we can actually simulate this by adding a little bit of, here we go. Uh, it's going to be warm enough for us to actually survive on it. Now, every star um, in the galaxy, in the universe, has this sort of a region of space. And we usually um, know where this region is based on the classification of a star. So, Wolf 1061 is a little bit smaller than our sun. It's actually only, only about 25% of the mass. So, its region is a lot closer to um, to the actual star uh, in comparison to our planet. So let me just go to, I'm gonna go to the original simulation right here that uh, shows us our solar system. And we're going to enable this uh, Goldilocks area by enabling habitable zone, let's make it flat, and here we go. So you can see that Earth is sort of on the border of that uh, area. It's it's also known as a habitable zone, and um, so is Mars. But Venus is a little bit too close, which is why Venus is actually relatively hot, whereas Mars is relatively cold. But anywhere between Earth and Mars, this is where we had our habitable zone. Now, depending on the star classification, uh, we we've actually managed to sort of establish this zone for most types of stars. So, for example. If I were to take a look at, um, let's just add a new star here, or actually no, let's just uh, change the mass of our sun so you can see how it changes. So as I increase the mass of the sun, you'll notice that um, the zone expands outwards. That's because um, obviously sun starts producing more heat. So now Earth and Mars are actually within the inhabitable part of the habitable zone, whereas Vesta, Ceres and uh, all of the asteroids are within the habitable zone. So unfortunately now Earth will start becoming too hot for us to survive on it, which you can see that 
if I look at the surface of our planet, it will now have completely changed into a very dry, very hot, um, inhabitable planet. Now, so that's that's what, how habitable zone works. And like I said before, uh, for every classification of a star, and of course the classifications of stars have been developed over the past um, hundreds of years, um, all of these stars uh, have different habitable zones. Now, so. And so the way we know where this zone is, is by looking at the star in the distance. So let's just say we found a new star somewhere far away. Let's just put a star somewhere here. And it's going to be a star Sirius uh, 11 light years away from us. If we go to Sirius, we'll now see that... Actually, for some reason, Sirius doesn't actually show it, but Rigel is showing the, the zone. And uh, so here, for Rigel, this um, green zone, the habitable zone, is a little bit farther away. Specifically, it's at a distance of anywhere between 100... Uh, what is this, 115 astronomical units to about 160 astronomical units, which is actually farther away than Pluto. Uh, so th the Rigel system would only have habitable zone farther away. And because we know what uh, Rigel type is and what its mass is, we can sort of um, estimate the habitable zone for most other stars based on our classification. So when we discover this new star, called Wolf 1061, we knew that uh, because of its mass and because of uh, its color and because of its spectral uh, analysis, what, what kind, the kind of materials that it has on the inside, uh, we could estimate that its habitable zone is anywhere between 1.3 to about 2.8 million kilometers. So it's about uh, almost like 10 times closer than uh, what this would be for Earth. And Earth is obviously at a distance of approximately this far away from the star, if it was basically our sun. Uh, so it, it's a lot closer to the star, and obviously uh, here the planets would orbit a lot faster as well. Now this planet that we're interested in, the planet that we might refer to as Earth 2.0 from now on, the planet that is possibly Earth-like and possibly is within this uh, habitable zone region, um, it actually orbits this star at at a speed of about 50 kilometers per second, but also the orbital period here is only 18 days. So basically one year on this planet is 18 days long. And this is really the important part. So the way we know that this planet is in habitable zone is because we are actually able to calculate um, the habitable zone for various star classifications based on what we know from our sun. So let's actually think backwards here. How do we know that this planet is habitable? So we're going to go back to our solar system and think about it this way. So we know that if we find a star that's very similar to our sun, has a very similar spectrum, relatively similar mass, and relatively similar everything, we know that for a planet to be in a habitable zone, it has to have an orbital period between one Earth year to approximately two Earth years for planets like Mars. So if a planet orbits around the star in a period of between one year and two years, and a star is very similar to our sun, then we can assume that it's within habitable zone. So if I were to make a completely new system, so we're going to place a random star right here. It's going to have a very similar mass and very similar spectrum to our sun, but this star is called Apuista, I think. And uh, we're going to basically place a planet, a random rocky planet, approximately at a distance of about one astronomical unit away from the star so that its orbit will take it uh, just over a year. So this will be an orbit of just over a year and we can actually check this by going right here. So it's 1.06 years. So uh, technically this should be in the so-called habitable zone. And as long as this planet has atmosphere, this planet known as uh, Matia should now become uh, Earth-like. This should technically become Earth 2.0. So let's see if this happens. And while we're waiting for it to change temperature and everything else, let's look at its habitable zone again. So uh, if we go in here and enable habitable zone, you'll see that, look at that, it, it is within this habitable zone. But because this planet is a little bit bigger than Earth, and because um, it has a much lower albedo, basically doesn't reflect as much light, it's actually getting a little bit hotter than Earth. So, but it, it, the idea here is very simple. So, as long as we know the period of uh, the orbit, and as long as we can actually uh, um, establish what sort of a star this is, we can uh, estimate and we can actually try to figure out if this planet is within so-called habitable zone. But the question now is, how do we actually know if there's a planet around the star? Because stars, if, if you look at those little stars in the distance, they're really, really tiny. We don't really, how do we even see planets? 
And this is where the super powerful um, telescopes come in and help us figure out if there is a planet orbiting around a star. And I'm gonna use Space Engine to try to show you how we actually know when there are uh, planets around stars. And so here we are in Space Engine staring at our sun. Now imagine we're actually looking at our sun using a very, very powerful telescope. And this is what we see. We see a very bright star. Now we're going to adjust our exposure here by using these buttons on the bottom. And uh, what we're looking for is, well, this right here is, I believe, Mercury. So let's just, let me just double check if this is Mercury. Uh, yes, it is. And I'm going to accelerate time and show you how we know when there is a planet orbiting around a star. So I'm going to increase time here. And basically, as the telescope st uh, stares at these stars, once in a while, what we see is this. We see a planet. Okay, we didn't see that, but let's try this again because it actually passed behind the sun. We see a planet and let me just stop it when it gets here. Oh, look, at that. there's actually two planets coming, but right around here and stop. Maybe a little bit more. There we go we actually see a passage of a planet in front of the star. Uh, and this is when the actual brightness of the planet decreases just a little bit and then it increases again. And if we see this decrease in brightness periodically, so if it's basically, if it happens, let's just say it happens every three months, we can actually um, assume that there's there's a planetary passage around this planet in a very predictable um, orbital pattern. Oh, I just saw a comet. I hope you saw it too. And um, as we see more of these orbital passages, we can then estimate the distance of, um, of every planet uh, that orbits around this star using uh, the orbital formula that you see in front of you. Basically, the orbital period is found using this formula and all of these uh, values we already know. And so in this formula, we pretty much know everything. We know the T, which is the period, which is basically how, um, how long it takes for Mercury to uh, orbit around the Sun, which is what we calculate by measuring these dims that we see once in a while. Um, then Pi is, of course, uh, a constant. So is GM. GM is a gravitational constant that's um, it's basically the same everywhere in the universe. And the only unknown here is R. And this is essentially what we're uh, looking for by using all of these added values. And once we find R, we can actually estimate if the actual orbit of the planet that you see right here is within the habitable zone region. So if it is within, within habitable zone, then uh, it's very likely that it's an Earth-like planet. And if it's not within the habitable zone and lies somewhere outside of it, in other words, if R is too large or too small for uh, a star with specific classification, then we can assume that it's either too hot or too cold. And so just to summarize all of these steps that scientists take to discover these planets, first, we obviously need to know the classification of a star we're looking at. Then we need to find out how many planets pass in front of it. So if I were to disable this, how many times do I see these dims in front of the star and how often do they occur? Using this period, uh, orbital period, we can estimate the radius of orbit, uh, or in other words, how far away the planet is from the star. And once we know their orbits, we can try to estimate if these orbits lie within the habitable zone and if these planets possibly are Earth-like. So it's actually not a very difficult process. The, the most difficult part of the detection of uh, these planets is, of course, staring at the star for many, many, many months and possibly even years to try to find this particular dimming but of course, there are so many challenges that come with this. And of course, if a star uh, or basically the planets that orbit around the star are aligned differently to us, like in a, if they're sort of like this, and we never get to see the uh, planets that pl pass in front of it, then we'll never really know if there are other planets around it or if those planets are habitable. However, if the stars... Um, planets orbit in such a way that they pass in front of it once in a while and we get to see them or we get to see the dimming effect, then we can possibly estimate if some of those planets are habitable and essentially maybe one day even go there and settle it as our next home. So this is how scientists and astronomers do it and this is how you can possibly do it too one day if you become an astrophysicist or an astronomer. Now, hopefully this video was clear, and if you've enjoyed this video, like it, share it with your friends, and subscribe to this channel if you still haven't.
Also, check out some of the other Space Engine and Universe Sandbox 2 videos that I posted previously. And of course, leave a comment telling me about how you think we might be able to find new planets and new stars that have uh, habitable planets around them. If you can think of any other way of finding those planets, please post it in the comment below and I'll forward it to NASA so that we can actually start looking for them. Thank you for watching, guys, and game you later. Bye-bye.